Hi, I'm Sam. I want to start with a story from my bar mitzvah. Um, <laughs> I, got, uh, I got a gift from this relative. I'd only met him a couple times. He was really uh, a strange guy. And this gift was a book. It was this 500-page book all about mushrooms. And I thought it was really, really weird. Um, you know, I put it on a shelf and pretty much forgot about it for years. I never expected that years later, in engineering school of all places, my life would be changed to revolve around fungi. So I'm going to talk a lot about fungi in just a minute. First, I want to introduce our company, Ecovative. We're a biomaterials research company that exists at the intersection between ecology, uh, natural systems, and human in innovation and ingenuity. And what we're all about uh, is solving the problem of plastics. Now, we heard a lot about plastics yesterday, so I'll try not to repeat all that. Uh, but I want to add a few insights of my own. Uh, most people in our culture today really don't understand plastics. They don't know where they come from. So I want to give you my super simplified story. This plastic start with life. It starts with the life of algae and plants and dinosaurs. They pull energy from the sun. And then we wait. After they die, we wait 65 million years for unique geological conditions to turn them into oil. The, the story is similar for natural gas. And after 65 million years, we use some of the most advanced, expensive polluting equipment ever developed to suck it out of nooks and crannies all over the planet. And we transport it and synthesize it, and eventually it becomes you know, this plastic bottle that sits in front of you that you'll, you'll use for minutes. And then we throw it away. But there is no away. Away is just the landfill on the other side of town. So plastics and expanded plastics, foams, are the worst defenders. They take up 25% of our landfills by volume. What's worse is plastics are entering our environment. Uh, there's areas in the Pacific Ocean gyres where they've measured more bits of plastic than bits of plankton. And in many cases, these plastics are bioaccumulating toxins. They're entering our food chain, and we're poisoning our planet. So I don't think it's an overstatement to say that the future of life on planet Earth is at stake here. And it's a hard problem because plastics have allowed us to achieve so much in our, in our lives. You know, our grandparents lived in a time without plastics, but since that time, Plastics have made possible everything around us. You know, there's plastics in these satellites. There's plastics in the smartphones that they're talking to. Um, it's, it's hard to imagine life without plastics. I've got plastics here right in my hand. Um, and when, I'm not saying here that if we don't stop using all plastics tomorrow, the Earth is going to explode. No way. This is, this is a long-term problem. It's a biological problem. Because plastics, they're fundamentally unsustainable because they're not biocompatible with life on Earth. Life evolved without plastics. It doesn't know. Life doesn't understand how to handle plastics. And so these plastics, when we throw them away, they'll be, they'll be around for an insanely long period of time. They just don't work, and we need alternatives. So luckily, here on planet Earth, we've got a lot of great alternatives, a lot of renewable, uh, biocompatible materials. Throughout history, we've got, uh, we use plants to make wood, cotton. We use animals to make leather and wool. Um, Lately, there's uses of bacteria to transform plants into some interesting biomaterials. But the kingdom of fungi has been completely ignored. We've never used mushrooms for materials. Until 2007, uh, in engineering school, two of my friends, Eben Bayer and Gavin McIntyre, came to me and told me about this idea they had in a class called Inventor Studio to use mycelium, the root structure, essentially, of mushrooms to grow materials. And you know, I thought it was a neat idea. Uh, but like a lot of student projects, uh, I thought it was kind of crazy, especially coming from two guys who are not biologists. They're also mechanical engineers. Um, but Gavin said, yeah, I've got samples. They're growing under my bed. I'll show you in a couple of weeks. <laughs> and sure enough, it worked. Um, so they you know, met up with them in a few weeks, and they showed me the first samples of mushroom materials. And they're kind of crumbly. They're, they're nothing like the samples that I'll pass out in just a minute. Um, but it was amazing. My mind was blown because they had grown fungi into shapes, these crisp, sharp rectangles. They were growing the raw material in the finished form all at once. It was really remarkable. It's really true biomimicry. Um, you know, it's almost a step beyond a bioadaptation. Um, it's, it's using nature as nature is intended. So what we're doing with these mushroom materials uh, is we're, we're giving this mycelium, this fungal tissue, everything it wants, food, air, water, and a, and a nice home. The only difference is that instead of its home being shaped like the forest floor, where it naturally grows, its home is shaped like a corner block or some product that meets a human need. So let's zoom in on this. 
Uh, inside every cubic inch of this, there's about eight miles of these white fibers. They're called mycelium. It's like a natural uh, non-woven fabric, a textile that weaves itself. It's a growing glue. And it grows incredibly quickly. So this black particle here will zoom out. That's corn stalks. So we can use a wide range of agricultural byproducts. So at our facility in New York, we're using corn stalks. When we eventually set up a factory in China, it may use rice hulls. And we can tune the material properties depending on what we put into it. These agricultural products get partially digested. It's food for the fungi. But it also acts as strong rebar. And it really strengthens these materials. They're really tough. So this is a time lapse. I want you to watch carefully. Watch that white stuff. It's growing. We're watching three days of growth in just 10 seconds. And all of this growth happens indoors, in the dark. It doesn't need light or watering. It just self-assembles. It's really amazing. And once it's done growing, this, this corner block here you just watched grow, once it's done growing, we pop it in an oven, we bake it, which kills it. So it's totally inert. There's never any spores, no allergen concerns. Um, just like a cardboard box won't sprout trees, this won't ever sprout mushrooms or <laughs> do anything weird. Um, and we can mold it into any shape. So this, this mycofoam material can replace uh, all sorts of expanded plastics, expanded polystyrene, polypropylene, polyethylene. We're able to uh, match the performance. We're able to meet the cost today. Um, and then there's all these sustainability benefits, right? It's bio-based, it's renewable, and it's home compostable. So your next product, we're shipping everything from furniture to electronics, might just come packaged in mushroom packaging. And if you get this, you can crumple it up, you can use it as mulch in your garden, you can compost it at home. If your city has municipal composting, that's awesome. Um, you can also put it in with your yard waste. Uh, if it goes to a landfill, you still have all of the beginning of life environmental benefits. Um, and mushroom packaging is real today. Um, so today, you know, instead of this corner block, we're meeting or exceeding the performance and we're matching the cost with mushroom packaging. This is real, it's available today. Uh, we've licensed the technology to the Sealed Air Corporation, specifically for protective packaging in North America and Europe. Um, and together, uh, we're, we're making this available to the world. We're building a second factory now in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, um, and it's really doing amazing things. Um, since launching Mushroom Packaging, we've grown the team. We're almost 60 ecovators, as we like to be called. Um, scientists, biologists, mycologists, engineers, production growers, and business innovators. We've built a 40,000 square foot factory, which is focused primarily on packaging in Green Island, New York. And we're just bringing online, along with our partner Sealed Air, a second facility in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. But packaging is just the beginning, right? We're not a packaging company. We're a material science company. And what we're really excited about with this partnership with Sealed Air is it frees us up to focus on what we do best. Uh, because mushroom materials, it's a platform technology. You know, packaging or plastics are a lot more than just packaging. Plastics can be anything. And the same is true with, with mushroom materials. Um, so what I want to share with you today and what's being passed around now are samples that are fresh out of our lab. These are prototypes of some wild ideas. But we can't do them all. We can't do them all at once. Um, so what I'm looking for your, your help on is figuring out what's the next big thing and where should we focus. So I want to share just a few, a few ideas and a few cool things that we've been working on recently. Uh, this material works great as insulation. We're uh, approaching the thermal values uh, of EPS. Uh, and what's, what's really exciting is the health and safety implications. So these materials are a class A fire rating without any flame retardants. You can hold a blowtorch up to it, and it won't melt or catch fire. Uh, and it's also VOC3. So uh, to prove it, we grew a house. This mushroom tiny house uh, is insulated, but it's also the mushroom insulation forms the structure. There's no studs in those walls, and it's really strong. This is mounted on a trailer. We towed it at 70 miles an hour. It's pretty, <laughs> it's pretty cool. Um, we're really excited about this one. So these, these low-density, lightweight materials, we can compress them and squeeze them while they're growing and make something that's an alternative to engineered woods, particle boards, fiber boards. Uh, but these materials are tree-free, and they're formaldehyde-free. Uh, normally, these materials are great as electrical insulators. We're exploring them for uh, insulators in electric vehicle battery stacks. Um, and this, this idea is a little far out, but we've succeeded in uh, adding copper while they're growing to make them not uh, insulative, but conductive. And so one day in the far future, we might be able to grow circuitry that's compostable and flexible, maybe even a growing smartphone. This is kind of an embarrassing photo. But uh, 
It's great for marine applications. Uh, it's marine degradable. So um, next week in Costa Mesa, California, we'll actually be unveiling the world's first mushroom surfboard, which I think is really cool. Um, way better than my boogie board. Um, but we're, we're also prototyping things like lobster buoys that are a major contributor to uh, Pacific uh, or to, to ocean plastic pollution. Um, and we're working with NOAA on a unique marine uh, buoy deployment system. So when they push these scientific buoys off a boat and it smacks the water, it protects them. And then that, that cushion becomes fish food and doesn't last forever in the ocean. Um, and this one I'm hoping will hit home with a few in the audience today. Uh, we think it's got a lot of cool applications with footwear. Uh, a really neat property with mycelium is that um, beside being a cool material itself, it can bond into and, and latch onto other materials. And it doesn't even need to be a natural material. It just needs to have some texture and porosity to grow into and for that mycelium to really latch onto. Uh, so passing around the, the audience um, are a few prototype shoes that you can check out. So if your company is still using plastic foam packaging, we need to talk. <laughs> um, but what I'd really, what I'd really like to, to learn from you is, uh, is there a market need for, for any of these materials uh, that we've developed? And we really need to find partners that can provide not only funding uh, to match grant funding, but really expertise. Because uh, we're experts in fungi and these materials, but we don't know what your companies are doing. And we need to figure out what's the best use, what's the next use for mushroom materials. Thank you. So we'll take a few burning questions. We also we just remember that in the back row, we have uh, two mics. So don't speak unless they're because our millions of uh, Ustream viewers uh, won't be able to hear you. Mikkel. Yeah, I want to hear Nike's feedback on that mushroom shoe. <laughs> <laughs> I do, too. It was delicious. <laughs> <laughs> So I, so I used to do a, a demonstration like we saw with Q-Milk yesterday of eating it. Um, I don't do that anymore. We don't want to encourage it. <laughs> you know, it won't hurt you, but it's like eating corn stalks. It doesn't taste very good. Please. I just have a quick question. And, um, the insulation example with the little house, you said that most of the time you actually bake it once it's finished. So yes. what would you do in that situation? Because insulation is definitely, a, especially foam insulation, is a big problem. That's a great question. So. Uh, insulation is potentially many different products, many different uh, wall assemblies for different regions. Um, we're exploring a lot of conventional applications, structural insulating panels, for example. It's a, a sandwich normally of styrofoam and, and plywood or OSB. Uh, so we can offer a drop and replacement for that. We would bake it, kill it. Uh, uh, we're also now working on insulated sheathing, which is a similar thing for retrofit applications. Uh, the Mushroom Tiny House, though, is a radical experiment. You can learn more at mushroomtinyhouse.com, by the way. <laughs> Um, so the, the Mushroom Tiny House is a, is a really uh, sort of crazy radical experiment, and so far it's been a success of growing the insulation right in the walls. The house is too big to roll into our drying ovens, so we never kill it, right? So it's, it's actually still alive right now. And the idea is that um, when this organism dries out, it doesn't die, but it goes dormant and stops growing. Um, and so the wall assembly is designed so that these, these pine tongue and groove boards that make up the walls sort of slowly wick the moisture out. And once it solidifies, uh, it just sort of goes dormant and stops. So uh, it's got some cool potential properties where if you have a roof leak, you might have a visual indicator because you'll get a mushroom sprout out. <laughs> so you know, you know where to fix it. Um, and, and potentially, you know, if something breaks, you can, you can peel the wood off, spritz it with water, and it'll self-heal. Um, so we think, we think it's actually you know, pretty radical and out there. So it's probably not where we'll start. Uh, but really has some, some revolutionary ideas. You know, normally we try to avoid having fungus in our walls, and this just <laughs> turns it on its head. So we'll take two more questions, Jim and then Nancy, and then we'll, then we, we'll give you a chance to ask questions. I think it's fairly obvious, but you didn't actually say it. Uh, how do you make the form? Are they grown in molds, like the corner cube you're holding? Yeah. Is it, um... yeah uh, so today all of our materials are grown in forms. Uh, the forms are made of plastic. Uh, but they get reused over and over, uh, hundreds of times, and eventually recycled. Uh, we're working on new methods of molding, uh, certainly for flat sheets, for big insulation panels. Uh, that technology is not the right fit. Uh, and we're also working on casting, so we can have one mold that just pumps them out by the millions. 
Nancy? Uh, Sam, we've seen some of the thicker pieces. What is mm -hmm. the thinnest that you might envision for a product? That's a great question. So uh, with microfoam, these, these thick materials, uh, the limitation is the feed stock. So those corn stocks, you know, we're using pretty sizable particles. And so it's hard to, to mold very thin features. There's a couple samples going around now of some next generation materials that I didn't really talk about. Uh, and those are pure mycelium. And so we're, we're just starting to explore ways to separate the food from the mycelium uh, and just extract the mycelium. And the properties of mycelium are, are really remarkable. I mean, it's, it's like stronger than balsa and it doesn't have a grain to it. Um, it's, it's really a remarkable natural material. So uh, we think there's a lot of potential there. It's a little longer term, but certainly for things like shoe soles and, and higher performance applications, um, we think it's, it's really exciting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Jeff.